Okay, for you that don't know, my name is uh, Dick Zimmer. Uh, sometimes they call me the Mac Man, although I think that may be a, a misnomer now. I used to think I was pretty good at catching weight drop, but there's some guys now that are way better than I am. But uh, nonetheless, I can get you started. Get your point in the right place. And they do like to use my cat. <laughs> so to start out with weight drop, if you're not familiar and you're uh, wanting to know the beginning, I'm good at that for you. There's a lot of things happening in flathead lake right now. Probably the most exciting vision is uh, the white fish. How many of you have fished for the white fish in, in common? So you know then, uh, how much fun that is and how good they are to eat and how it is uh, that you catch so many when you get home you wish you hadn't kept some. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, by end of the lake, the main thing that the people are looking for right now is the perch fishing out in East Bay. And because we've had such an unusually cold uh, year, uh, it's just now barely starting up. <coughs> then the next week, you know, if you want to get in on that perch fishing. But there's the uh, uh, thing about perch uh, that uh, uh, you need to be aware of because there's going to be times and years when it's not going to be real good, and then there's going to be years when it's just super. And the reason that is is because they're sick with it. And out in the main lake, uh, their cycle usually ends with a disease. They'll get a disease and within two or three years you can't catch a, an adult perch out in the lake. And right now we're at the height of the cycle and there's just lots and lots of perch out there. So more, more than I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> we have the best perch fishing through the ice uh, as well as really good lake trout fishing because when you've got a lot of forage fishing shallow, uh, you're going to have a lot of lake trout coming in to eat them. So uh, those things are happening. The uh, smallmouth bass are working their way up from the south end of the lake to the north end of the lake. So that's a new fishery that uh, is really uh, lots of fun. And I'm hoping that it will establish more of a balance because if we can thin the perch out to the point where they don't get this disease out in the main lake, then we can have a, a continued uh, fishing period. Plus. Uh, the little fry, when they start coming in, that's what gets the whitefish to bite. And you can put an indication down there. It, uh, well, as you all do the fish for them, know you can catch lots and lots of fish. Uh, okay, start out with lake trout fish, and I'll go through that pretty fast. First of all, you need a good anchor system. And if you can't afford a uh, GPS anchor system, which is by far the best tool, but they're very expensive, then uh, you want a conventional anchor. And so what you need is something that, uh, first of all, a really big boat is going to have a lot of wind resistance. And so you're going to be a little bit of a disadvantage if you have a really big boat. You're going to need a bigger anchor than uh, if you have a small boat. And then if you have a real small boat and the weather gets bad, then you're going to have to worry about uh, Sink it. <laughs> 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 you, 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 you want to find a in between place. And uh, uh, you, know, you can find for use a conventional anchor. Now, if you have a GPS anchor system, they seem to work well for any, any kind of uh, boat. You know, you can go to big boat, any kind of boat. But uh, what you need out there is something, first of all, that, uh, you know, Get into the rocks if it's rocky. So you don't want real heavy stuff. If you got, you know, a big, some of these anchors, big heavy spikes on them, and everything, they won't dig in and they'll drag. So you want something that will dig in, and then uh, you want something that won't. Uh, if it's a muddy bottom, you don't want spikes that will hold it up above the bottom. You want the spikes to go through the mud and the mud plate to get into it bottom so that you get a good, a good uh, anchor set. 
Uh, I've had guys with this particular angle, they put rhino hat on it. Could, I mean, this is ugly. You could, you could sit on it or kick it or put a hole in your upholstery, so you got to be careful with it. But it's really effective. You can have something that's uh, nice in the boat, but it's not going to hold you, you know, once it the sand. And so, uh, this particular anchor digs in really well in most conditions. Now, the other anchor is similar to that uh, in the way that it will hold you. It's called a dam sport, and it's got relatively thin spikes in it, uh, on a hinge. And that works really well in most conditions, but if you're on a steep incline, then that will have a tendency <coughs> The skip it won't uh, hook up on you. So something like this, you know, it's ungainly, but it's effective. Now, if uh, you work with an anchor, you know that the uh, more anchor line you let out, the better it holds because you get a better angle uh, at it. Well, what we've come up with is a system where you create that angle, and the way you do that, you put a secondary anchor. And uh, I like to have, you know, guys will put a chain on it and that kind of does the same thing. But the problem with the chain is, is that you're uh, stuck with it. It's a permanent fixture. Well, something like this, you can take it off if it's a calm day and if it's a rough day, you can put it on. Some guys will even put a, a carabiner or a stock here and uh, they'll uh, uh, just be able to hook this anchor on and let it slide down to it or it starts to get windy. But what I do, is uh, put a loop in it, go through. Okay, you got another anchor on there. And this does two things. It creates an angle between this anchor and that anchor, and also it's a cushion against wave action. So this is, you know, if you're starting out, this will suffice until you decide you want to go pro, like these guys are out there doing the, the tournaments and get a GPS anchor system. So this is the beginning of that. <coughs> okay, now for a pole, also, you know, you can do like the pros, you can get a uh, four to six hundred dollar uh, pole, G. Loomis or, or St. Croix, and there's some others that make really good poles. But to start out with, uh, something that's lighter all to light, an ugly stick, you know, this one uh, proves the point that they last a long time. Like me, I'm kind of like an ugly stick. This is this is a, a typical uh, lake trout setup. You have a fly with a jig below. Everything glows in the dark because there's no light penetration past 150 feet, and even above that, uh, there's not much. So, you know, anything down at 80 feet and deeper, uh, if you have something that glows, it's going to be uh, a plus for it. It's going to enhance your bait. Now, uh, for bait, Because there's no light penetration past 150 feet, and most of the, if you're fishing for numbers and better eating fish, you're going to be fishing probably 180 to 220 feet. Scissors is a good idea. That'll speed things up. But you don't want to uh, put a big blobby piece of bait on it. What you want is something fairly small, triangle shaped. And here again, those fish can't see down there, so the main scent that they use is their sense of smell. 
and so you want to change your bait often and you can now this particular bait we we make it and uh, it's a combination of fish eggs salt and sugar coloring and pork sausage lake trout like pork fat the guys are fishing from the shore they're uh, Favorite bait is uh, a link sausage. <laughs> and throw it out there and just let it sit and, and wait for the market to go. Well, actually, the better bait than pork sausage is the whole fish. But it's pretty hard to cast the whole fish. You can't get them very far out there. And so, uh, for practicality, saying, don't send this out. Try not to hook anybody. <laughs> Okay, now you want to use the okay, lighter ultra light pole and you want to use braid line in that, in that deep water, especially because, uh, uh, first of all, even the best monofilament stretches 25%. And uh, if you use braid and then you go back to monofilament, it feels like you're fishing with a spring. Just way lot uh, uh, give in there that uh, uh, the braid doesn't have. The braid has the same feel and three feet as it has a 300 year And so you have sensitivity with it. Plus, you have, they caught a real hard mouth fish. In fact, uh, one of the reasons I like to use a spin reel as opposed to a casting reel is because I tighten my drag way down. I don't want it to slip when I hook, uh, set the hook. And, and if you realize you have a big one on, with a spin reel, you can open your brake and reel with it. You know, and generally, a lake trout won't make really, really long runs like a steelhead or a salmon. They'll make short, real fast runs. They'll break your line if you're not ready for it. But it usually doesn't last uh, a long time. You know, it it uh, stops pretty quickly. So uh, I, I, with that particular outfit, I've landed them up to 28 pounds. And, uh, just using that, you know, a lot, a lot of people don't feel like that's kosher, that you're supposed to use your drag, but fully with kosher. You <laughs> can <laughs> catch fish. And then when you're fishing white fish, now they, you know, people will go all to light and they get really surprised because they'll get broke off, you know, right off the bat. And here again, you know, if you can, uh, you can, you, you with white fish, because they're soft enough, you can you know, leave a little bit of drag. But I still like to have that option of being able to open my brake and reel with it. Okay. Bait, line, hole, that'll get you started. You need some kind of fish finder. This is the very simplest you can get. And uh, I, you know, what you want to watch for, not a bad idea to have a a bathymetric map. So you can see what the bottom structure is. You know, if you'll see, uh, coming off Wild Horse Island, there's real close areas, and then it splits other places. Real close, uh, so it's dropping really fast, and then it widens up. So what's happening here is dropping, and then it's cupping out. And where it cups out is uh, where you want to be. And if you're looking for fish on your fish finder, you're probably going to be disappointed because when those lake trout are feeding, they're right on the bottom and they're sweeping the bottom. They're stirring up these strings. Well, there's not enough space between, you know, I've heard people say that your fish finder leaves the fish bladder, but I don't believe it. That those fish are so close to the bottom that there's no space and you won't read them. And if you do see them and they're suspended, they're probably not feeding. You know, that's, Case in a lot of fish. Uh, you know, white fish, a lot of times. Well, I, I talked to a guy who put their, uh, their uh, cameras down there and watched them, and they're cut their heads right down in the weeds, and they're working the weeds, and they stir up these perch, and then they get at them. Well, uh, your fish finder is just going to breed weeds, but if you, there's always a few white fish that will come up. So, you know, if you're going along and you see one or two fish, when you're looking in white fish area, you see one or two fish suspended, that's probably a good place because probably a lot more of them that you can't see. With lake trout, I don't look for fish at all. 
and they just look for strong memory. And so when you got these places that are real steep, and you come to a place and you level out, I come back to that. And the reason for that is, is because they're feeding on shrimp down there, and the shrimp don't like to seem to stay on a steep incline. And where it cups out, that's where they'll concentrate. Because they come down and then they stop right there. And so that's where the leg come will often be uh, the fitness. So, uh, and your fish finder is a tool that way uh, for finding where the fish are, but you don't necessarily uh, need to see fish. Uh, and Flathead Lake. Okay, the shrimp will go really deep, but the lake trout would prefer to eat them in shallow water. The reason for that is uh, there, there, there's two things that oxygenate the water. If it's cold, it oxygenates. Warm water doesn't have near as much oxygen as cold water does. And uh, the less pressure there is on the water, the more oxygen there is in it. So the deeper they go, if you go, the uh, uh, more oxygen has uh, gotten pushed out of the, of the water. So because of the, of the way they manage the lake crop, and they seem to cut their numbers down, the shrimp numbers seem to be coming up. And when the shrimp numbers come up, they have a tendency to go shallower. And so whereas Oh, six, seven years ago, 250 feet was kind of a pivot down. You know, either go shallower or deeper than 250 feet down. Now, it's about, oh, uh, 200, you know, 180 to 220 is where people are catching most of their fish. And it's probably because that shrimp population has increased, and these fish would prefer shallower water with more oxygen in it. You know, they're more comfortable with that. So, uh, and then, you know, if, you, if for some reason or another the shrimp population goes down and they're really deep, uh, the lake trout go after them. They just don't feel as comfortable uh, in that deep water as they do in the shallow water. Okay. Now, lake trout are territorial. And uh, if you're fishing where they have the sense of sight, you got to move a lot. You know, and that happens in the fall when they spawn. You know, if you come to a point and, and you're catch four, five, or six, and then you have a lull. Uh, you know, as fishermen, we're supposed to be patient. Well, uh, you're better off if you're not patient in that sense. You know, the guy that wants to stay, say, well, just move this way, they'll start biting. And I said, no, it's better to move, because any fish that you're gonna bite in a given area will generally bite. And then after that, whatever's there isn't gonna be as active. Now in deep water, because they don't have a sense of sight, uh, area that they're feeding in is a lot smaller. And so uh, you need to be able to change. Now, if you have an anchor like this and you're in 250 feet, uh, there's not many folks that want to just pull up and move if they don't have to, because that's a lot of time wasted and energy lost uh, pulling up that much anchor. So there's things you can do. There's more people here than I figured. As you pass these out, there's things that you can work with. To uh, move a little bit. all, you get anchored up, and drop your bait down, and you get the fish on the right way. And depending on how active the fish are that particular day, uh, you may continue to catch them, or uh, you won't. <coughs> they'll, they'll stop. So what you got to do is move a little bit. Yeah. And if you'll look on this uh, uh, copy. <coughs> okay, the, the, the way to get anchored with the least amount of resistance, so that if it's windy and you're having trouble with your anchor pulling loose, is to anchor right off your bow, because the, the wind is coming both sides of your bow. But if you want to use the wind to move you, I think the, the ideal uh, jigging boat using the conventional anchor would have a cleat about every foot, about a third of the way back uh, from the bow. And, and so what you do, uh, if you uh, hook into the starboard side, and pull you fork. I, I, sometimes if you anchor up and you find yourself too close to somebody, Put your anchor on the same side of that uh, person that you're too close to the end, and you'll see yourself pulled way away from it. So what, what you're trying to accomplish is you uh, uh, caught any given fish that are going to be active in, in a particular area. And so you either uh, let anchor line out or pull it in, 
and go left to right, and, and it'll, it'll move you into a new area. And I'm going to find that that's a lot simpler than picking up your anchor every time you're moving. And, uh, so it's uh, lake trout, uh, you're finding yourself in a new territory every time. I like to fish from a flow tube. And if I get a fish out of my flow tube, I just start picking while I land in the fish. So I'm in a completely new area uh, when I put my line back on. And that's always a plus for lake trout. You know, that too, big boy. I like to avoid crop because it's the same type of thing. You guys that win in the contest out there generally fish solo because you're again, you get a number of fish in uh, one area and uh, you're just sharing with somebody else. You know, it's kind of a selfish approach. Uh, and then another thing too, the guy that's in the front of the boat, you know, if you want to volunteer to be the anchor man, you have less movement at the front of the boat than you're doing at the back of the boat. And that's also a plus because of presentation. You want to be able to present your bait fairly vertically. And the reason for that is, is because in jigging, they, they advertise a lot of times that a, that a lure is lifelike. But when you're Jigging, you want to present something that's dead or dying. And so a little lateral movement doesn't work with it. Either if you want to have fast lateral movement, like throwing or spinning, and you get them in that mode where they want to attack, or you want to present something to them that's dead or dying, where they're just going to have an easy meal. And uh, a leg trout, when they attack, there's a lot of water movement. And the whole side of the fish is a uh, vibration sensor. And they can feel that. And so they know when there's an attack going on by what they feel underwater. So they'll come to where that's happening, looking for an easy meal. So they're always looking for, uh, well, the way a fish thinks is I want to put as little energy in to get as much nutrition as I can. And so uh, if you present something to them that uh, have very little movement, then they're going to have a tendency to get that uh, more than something. If, if just a slight lateral move, they, they don't seem to respond well to that. So staying vertical is going to be your best bet. And the guy at the front of the boat is going to have less movement, so his line is going to be more vertical. And that's another reason to use braid is because it, uh, uh, it's about a fifth the diameter of equal weight, weight monofilament. So if you're in 200 feet of water, that's a lot of line, a lot of drag down there. So if you've got thinner lines, it's going to come vertical uh, more quickly than you're going to have more time when you have that perfect presentation. Now there, you, you can find variations of that, but that's, you know, we're work, working with basic here now, so uh, that's a good way to start. Thank you for keeping your base uh, vertical. All right. And if you have any questions, just stop me. How do you make or prepare your bait? Okay, we spent a lot of time fishing for bait fish. In fact, if any of you want to help me out, uh, I'm paying 35 cents for everything nine inches and small because we have a really hard time getting small fish. We don't have the bigger fish that we make the cut bait out of, we, we don't have near as much problem here. But we're looking for those small fish, so if you've got a place where you can catch uh, big numbers of small fish, uh, you're doing me a favor to get them. So you sell it then? Yeah. And like I said, it's a whole fish setup. Uh, really effective uh, to use a whole fish for lake trout. You know, lots of effective to pick it up. And you got the of fish. But with lake trout, it's, they're, they're eating machines. And, uh, you know, when they, they feel a, a jig, they feel something hard. Uh, sausage is, is, is something that they'll hit that they don't hold. But they get a hold of a whole fish, and it's dinner time. You know, they're not, they're not going to. Uh, let that go. And the only time you generally lose them is if you don't uh, uh, have your setup right. I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and go into that now. Okay. So the whole fish, especially the pink fish, <laughs> definitely the way to go. This is our our setup. In fact, the only thing. Old fish that I got left in my freezer, they're all freezing. Yeah, okay, real simple. 
how to do this. You know, they, they, they've got ways that you can uh, run a needle through a fish and then put the hook right out through its mouth, put a travel through its mouth. And that's not necessary, especially those lake trout. But even pike, you know, that doesn't seem to be such a big deal. And what we do is the first soft spot on a fish, his head is hard and bony. And the first soft spot is just below the gill plate there. And so that's where we hook the hook in on the side. And we, I like rubber bands. You know, they've got a, an out, uh, setup called a quick start setup where you have a sliding hook on there. But you don't need that because it, they always invariably fall ahead first. And the pike and lake are the same. And so if you swallow them in here, if you got a hook somewhere down here, it's not going to do be in here. And uh, so we got something else that we get hooked up, and these uh, rubber bands are soft, you know, so there's going to be less that they feel. When they, when they begin to swallow it, it compresses this hook, and so they're not feeling a lot there. And generally, uh, you know, if you do everything right, what you'll do when you land the fish, you'll see about that much of the fish's tail sticking out of the, the fish. And uh, uh, the problem you're going to have, you're going to have to do some surgery to get your stuff back. And if you want to release the fish, just cut the line as, as close to the hook as you can. That's the only way you're going to be able to release him. And uh, that hook will, will uh, dissolve fairly quickly. You know, they, they've got uh, strong uh, chemicals in their body. Yeah. It'll, it'll uh, cause that to dissolve pretty quickly. Uh, I've been out and caught fish that apparently somebody caught the day before and released it. And, uh, that hook was still in its throat and swallowed my fish right past that. So they're eating machines, you know. Uh, nothing that uh, keeps them from eating a full throat. Super small fish. Uh, <coughs> uh, uh, this this is the one that's caught to the ice. It's a whole fish out at uh, Wall Street Park. Uh, I don't know, about a month ago. But there was lots of them. I, I went with them. A young fella, we were fishing between Malita Island and the shore because uh, okay. Malita Island and north wind coming this way it, it protects this in here south wind is protected in there so the ice will freeze up a lot faster in there than it will anywhere else and so that was the first place to freeze but uh, uh, we caught eight there uh, one day it's used that whole fish set up in about three hours and that's not unusual all now now this setup is, is also really effective in in uh, uh, open water there's a guy that regularly fishes it right in through here as well. And he and his daughter went out one day at one o'clock, which is late. You know, generally, that shallow water fishing is better in the morning. And deep water fishing is what you want to do in the afternoon. That way you can slow down, but uh, the fish will be more active in deep water uh, later in the day than they were in shallow water. But they were late in the day, and they ended up landing 14. Big lake trout. You know, when you're using a bait that big, it's good for an adrenaline rush because you know that it's probably not going to be too small of a fish that you have on there. But you have to control yourself. <laughs> you don't set the hook right away. You let the rod go up to a minute. You watch your school that, that particular fish there. I was fishing for perch. The magic depth for perch out there seems to be 35 to 40 feet. The magic depth for lake trout is 50 to 55. And so uh, out there in those days, it, it, it doesn't drop really fast, so there's a distance between you. And uh, I've got new glasses since then, but I, I couldn't see real good out there. But I kept looking at my bucket, and finally I started seeing it doing this. The old man sprinting on the ice, probably on the side of the hole. But that's what I was doing. Yeah. And uh, uh, I got out there, and that fish, it was right down to my back, and I had a big reel. I had the same size reel as I have on the boat. So uh, I was close to losing everything. Now, if you're 
Uh, okay, the reason I use a, a long pole like this is because uh, that won't track the same way your jig will. You know, because we're allowed to use uh, two poles a piece, and you got three or four guys in the boat. You only need one, possibly two. You know, you might have a bigger bait fish and then a smaller bait fish on another pole. But uh, I like to get it away from the jigs, and so I use a really long pole. And that way, uh, you know, the deep water jig and you know the part of the of the mastery of it is to get so you're not getting hung up with your neighbor all the time. You want to really be aware of distance. You want to stay as far away from your uh, neighbor as you can. And uh, if you get a big fish on, you know, a little fish, you know, when lake trout, their mentality is, how can something be getting me? So you hook into one, and it, it, they're pretty slow to figure out what's going on. And if it's a small fish, you're fishing deep, you're bringing them up, and flat it against the swell, against the belly, and he went quite right. Uh, pretty much straight up. But if you get a big fish on, you're not going to bring him straight up. And he's going to, you're going to have to bring him up slow, and he's going to be able to do a lot of lateral movement. And so if that occurs, everybody bring your, you know, you're going to save yourself a lot of headaches if everybody else reels up and they can get that fish in the boat. You know, these guys in the contest, because it's a numbers thing, most of them uh, don't like to catch big fish. It takes too much time to mess with them. Okay. Yeah? When you're fishing at uh, old fish for I see your sinker is what, about two feet up? Do you keep yeah. out the car? How far do you bring the fish off the bottom? Okay. That uh, is a sliding sinker on there. And if you're fishing really deep, you want to put two on. Now, this would probably be good for anywhere from about <coughs> 50 to 100 feet. But uh, I don't have to set up like that. But through the ice, because you're not fighting with boat movement or anything like that. Uh, I just put enough weight on there because when these fish are frozen, they're going to want to float in your hole. So you need a little bit of weight to get them started. Once they thaw, they'll sink fine. But you know, you're out there ice fishing or whatever, you got frozen fish. You want to get them started down. And uh, I just let them lay on the bottom. They seem to be able to, you know, I, I fish the boat with a, a bobber to keep it suspended a little bit and fish it right on the bottom. And, with that particular fish, it just sit on the bottom. They seem to be unaffected. They have enough, they're, they're real scent oriented, so they can pick up that smell and they'll pick it up and swallow it. In fact, uh, I've been an ice fisher and I've seen the light cop come in and hit my uh, jig and knock a maggot off, and the maggot fell down in the mud, and the light cop turned around and went down there and picked it out of the mud. So. <laughs> They don't like to uh, leave a meal. You know. And Pastor Mike's new you know, lake cock can be just as particular and hard to catch his trophy meal and white fish like that. Most of the time, they're pretty aggressive. They're spurt biters, but it's not unusual. You know, if, if, if you like to uh, use a camera and take pictures of somebody landing fish, you're losing opportunity. It's not unusual for everybody to start getting action at the same time, and then it shuts off at the same time as well. So when somebody gets a fish, you want to be uh, aware that your chances are really good too. Uh, the uh, unfair part about it is because they're so scent oriented that if you put a fresh bait on, uh, you're going to have the, uh, the chance to get the next fish. So if you pull off a fish and put a fresh bait on, it's not unusual for the same guy to catch the next fish. So, uh, there's a young fellow that uh, he hit his uh, mom ran from us, and I got him started fishing. His name was Stephen Nate. Some of you may remember that. He was one of the, the boy wonder fishermen. And he's good, too. He, you know, uh, there's certain people that like to. Uh, I got a friend that he gets on the phone and he says, uh, so-and-so is catching fish over there, and I know most of the fishermen. And some guys, they just make me nervous, because they'll be catching fish. I will say, I don't want to go over there and watch him catch fish. <laughs> 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 Mike Benson, the guy that's 
uh, leading the contest now. He uh, he doesn't like to be around Jason Mayo. Well, that may have changed. Well, he might use one catch all the fish. But uh, these are the the signature setups on the lake. Steve Benson won the first weekend. And Steve isn't real versatile fishing. He just sticks with that all the time. <laughs> Doesn't matter what's going on or anything, he, he sticks with that. Uh, now this is his brother Mike. He's uh, winning the contest now, and that's you know his starting <coughs> setup. He, he's pretty versatile, and that and that helps him. And then Jason Malin, he's probably the hardest worker. Uh, he uh, he's partners in at the Moore Valley Meat Pack. <laughs> but uh, that's the setup he uses. Brightness. Question. Yeah. How, how would a slip washer or a slip tanker work? And what's the purpose of it? Well, okay, what you want to do when you're when you're fishing this type of uh, setup, if you can, you want to leave your bail open. Well, I even loosen my drag wire. You know, like say with if you're jig fishing, you want to have your drag tight. But this you want them to feel as little resistance as possible. And so when they take off, this is sitting on the bottom. Okay, somebody else had a question there. Yeah. You say you're a one inch and two inch on the inside. Is that true? That's the only way to do it. They got a little bit of a variable. They don't have to, but that's the only way to do it. You know what? It depends on where you're at. Uh, okay. What you have, because of the rotation of the earth, Current works down this side of the lake. You know, and in the spring, when it starts to muddy up, uh, this side of the lake will often muddy up, and this side will stay clear because that current is coming to this side. So, when there's current involved, a lot of times uh, they'll come in shallow. And so, when it starts to muddy up, uh, a lot of times 50, 60 feet in this area can be really good. But in, in, in normal conditions, okay. Uh, plankton do the best in current neutral areas. And so these shrimp feed on plankton. And they come up off the bottom at night and they feed all night and then they go to the bottom of it. And they're just little guys, you know. And, and for them to go two or three hundred feet up and down, you know, that's, that's like hundreds of miles for us. But they do it. You know, every night they come up and they feed on those uh, on the, on the plankton and then they go back down. So. In, in areas that are current neutral, oftentimes there'll be more shrimp, and so in those areas there'll be uh, more uh, lake down. Uh, at least in theory. <laughs> now, this side of this deep probably has more current because it's on the west side, and oftentimes it's beneficial. Uh, down in Skidoo Bay, that was always uh, the best opening vision because uh, pretty much very very low uh, water movement, and uh, there's a lot of small lake trout right down there. A lot of times, you want to go for the price for the small fish. I think that's a good place to go. Um, you know, I don't know what all the variables are because uh, there are areas on this side, but then in, in coming out of Yellow Bay, right in here, often is uh, some of the best fish. So there's a lot, a lot of areas. I can, I can give you uh, uh, the basics, but that's not something that's always going to so if, When you get to like July, uh, that would be more current neutral? Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Then you go in the, in the summer. Okay. So in, in July, if you're on the east side, are, are you thinking you're probably going to be down that deep mm -hmm. in that time of year, down to the first feet? The shrimp like to stay deep. Okay. You know, Lake Monterey, uh, we don't have that deep of water. Here, but they find them down as deep as the storm fish and uh, But you know, we get down that deep and there's very little oxygen because of the uh, pressure thing. And so uh, the lake trout uh, don't often fall. I guess apparently the white fish do. Right? The white fish is going to be a little, a little more versatile. Huh? How deep is five hundred the deepest? Uh, 370, I think. Several years when getting down 300 feet was a good idea. 
didn't have very many people from Greenbridge out there in that building. Who wants to know from Anchorage? Anchorage. You buy thousand foot rolls and you break it up into 330 foot sections. And uh, that's adequate for most of those people. You've got to run on the road. That idea of yeah. letting the angle line out and change it to your new position. We got more than a flexibility challenge. Question here. Yeah. You're talking about coming up and putting on pressure eight. Right? Mm -hmm. Now you marinate yours the night before. Okay. Now, and I was wondering if you put we, on you pressure. Know, we have that. We have that sent in there okay. already. But what I'll do is I'll open my bag up and I like trim it. You know, that's kind of a universal uh, sandwich. And trip uh, all seems smell the same. Where they come out of the ocean, out of fresh water. So I'll stir some of that in there. But there's other guys like Mike Benson. He likes ants. He'll use garbage. WD-40 is a really good one. Just put it in your bag, and you don't have to uh, constantly put it on the bait. It's better to put a fresh bait on, because when you're throwing those baits over, that's a chunk. And it's not unusual at all, you know, that after a while you'll start bringing in fish that will have a piece of bait in the belt. So there's no doubt you're attractive about doing it. Guys, the chum is effective. Uh, somebody out there just found the corn or something that was attractive. In fact, we had some guys earlier this year, they were fishing off of painted rocks. Uh, and we have a, a lure called the Trilobite. It's kind of banana shaped. And painted rocks is right there. Right in here, and that's a good place to go this time of year. When when the runoff starts, generally they'll leave that painted rocks area and, and head north. But the whole the whole uh, north half of the lake, when when runoff starts, a lot of the fish will go here. It doesn't affect the fish on the south end so much, but they'll go up into that muddy water, and that's where we, you need to be when that happens. So this year, I don't know. Calisco might be underwater. <laughs> yeah, okay. There's a lot of snow up there, and it's not coming down, you know. See, it's building up there right now still. So, you guys That's a pretty good sign. Might, might invest in some sand bank, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> the vision, the sand bank yeah. Uh, okay. yeah, so, and, and you know, oftentimes, by, by now, one up has already begun. And, you know, crossing that river on the way up here, we did not come up an inch. The water, so. uh, there's going to be an unusual spring uh, this year for sure. You know, but lake trout seem to do well when they're going wrong. <coughs> Seems like they stay active. If you can get in a place that, where you're aware of a current in the in the lake, a lot of times uh, the current will uh, set them off. Seems like they, they like that movement. You know, that's kind of a, a contradiction, the, the current neutral thing. But uh, current carries more food. And so when, when there's a strong current, whatever's down there uh, that they're feeding on, that uh, is going to be moved. And they all respond and you know, start. You know, the more food available, the more activity. The less food of uh, food, uh, fish will go into a dormancy you know, from lack of food. In fact, the lake trout, when the, when the company first disappeared, uh, their mindset was to feed on kokanee. And there was uh, a lot of years there. And there was a lot of long, stringy fish with big heads and no growth rate. But you know, they made the transition to the feed on the train. And now, um, shallow water fishing is uh, really important because of the first no, you can stop. Uh, the fish have you know, finally evolved. There's quite enough new food source. When I was a kid, yeah. Except in, in the fall, you very seldom caught a lake trout in less than 100 feet, and most often even deeper than that. And then when the mice shrimp population uh, created that, uh, well, it did two things to the salmon. First of all, they uh, uh, put the, the salmon feed on the plankton, and so the shrimp were feeding on the plankton, so that was competition for the same food source. Plus, when lake trout spawn, uh, the little lake trout, when they hatch out, seem to go deep. Well, in Flathead Lake, it was pretty sterile down there, and they had very little survival. You know, so you had a few great big ones that finally come up and start feeding on the sand. So when the shrimp, what they did, they changed the energy level in the lake from where the plankton are, they took all that energy down to the bottom, and all of a sudden these little lake trout had a 
food source that they never had before, then it was like an explosion. I mean, that was just lake talk everywhere. You know, whereas before, you had to be deep. Uh, I was in uh, uh, East Bay one time when the ice was clear, and I saw a lake drop with his dorsal fin on the ice and his belly in the mud chasing perch. You know, so they were hungry, you know, they were looking for food anywhere they could find it. And so they need to be aggressively managed. And uh, uh, the way that they're doing it now is, from, from a fisherman's standpoint, and, and managing the species is a little too aggressive. But nonetheless, you know, to me, the ideal thing would be to open it up, have a 30 fish limit, open it up for rod reel commercial fishing, so that people are still putting a lot of pressure on them, but not as much as uh, they're putting on them now. But yeah. the good thing about uh, having the uh, predator uh, numbers down is we've got new species that are starting to play. And from a fisherman's standpoint, you know, they're definitely two different mindsets in this world today. Fisherman standpoint, a good fishery is uh, the optimum. And so these uh, smallmouth bass are doing really good. And I caught the state record down by Bolson here two or three years ago. Uh, the crappie are moving down the lake pretty quickly. They're at least as far as uh, Witch Bay. It could be. This is. <laughs> try to get myself in trouble. But a lot of folks wish that there were a wall getting started. Yeah, baby. But, but whatever uh, uh, is going on in that particular uh, realm, uh, having fewer lake trout is going to help. And so, from that standpoint, I say, go ahead, knock yourselves out, kill as many as you can and want to, because uh, new fish fishers are getting created. I got to go into all the pockets. <coughs> Divergent views. What about them? Okay. Okay, I want to talk to you about the thermal points and we'll get fun. Now, is there any more questions about lake trout fish? I think you could get out there and have an idea what to do. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. I'll, I'll make <clears throat> one statement. I usually fish by myself and I've got a big one. Mm -hmm. Why don't they get the boat ramps and that? I mean, you go down to Polson right now and Christ, I'm looking up there at the dock <laughs> and you know, I'm, I'm not much younger either. You're trying to get the foot over the boat and get everything. You know, it seems like we've got a beautiful okay. lake here and great fishery and doggone, they, they well, don't Well, somebody, somebody is uh, not really well informed, I think, when they start the engineering design and stuff. Because there's uh, that one, and then the one at Wall State, they built them on a point. And then the one at Wood Bay, too, I think, yeah. the same way. They built them on a point, and a point doesn't have a steep incline. You're off to the side, you have a lot steeper in uh, Big Arm, uh, Yellow Bay, Blue Bay, all of those are fairly steep. But the one at Polson, they built in on a point. The one at Wall Street built on a point. I'm trying to think. It seems like there's another one. Especially when the water's down. You're out there and, and your uh, tail pipe is blowing bubbles. Try to get your hand boat to float off. Uh, I think most government projects uh, don't get a lot of input from those that are going to use them, the resource. I, and I thought they were going to post, and I thought they were going to put in a boat ramp. Yeah. One of the government workers told me that. <laughs> and I was in a meeting. He said, uh, ah. <laughs> Okay, now the, 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 the thermal climb is, is a really important part of the lake. Uh, yeah. Scuba divers, when they get down to that, first of all, it looks like a mirror down there. They can't see through it a lot of times. It looks like a mirror. And then when they go through, they, they, they get the shivers. Because there's about a 10 degree difference between the top and the bottom of that. And uh, so the cold water species are going to be just under it, and the warm water species uh, above it and all the way to shore. 
is where they're going to be at. And where this is important is with the white fish, because that tunnel climb is like a fence. And you know, all the time I hear people say, you know, I was right next to a guy and he was catching them like crazy, and I wasn't catching. You know, and a lot of times they they think it's the jig, but I don't. I, I think that has very little to do with it. But being where that thermal line hits the bottom of the lake is, is really important. And so if somebody's catching fish, and they're fishing white fish, get on a line with them. Don't try to get next to them. If you're, on one side, you're going to be too shallow. On the other side, uh, there's not going to be near the concentration of perch. And the reason that there's a concentration of perch is because uh, what happens with, with a little perch? When the, they, they, the big perch spawn, these little perch spawn, uh, hatch out. Uh, they just head on into the lake. So just, you can be in 300 feet of water and you'll see a school of fish go by and they're a little perch going by. Well, towards uh, the middle to the end of July, these little perch start coming in. And uh, some of them come right on the surface. You know, you'll see these little perch uh, uh, dip on the, the surface. But a lot of them go deep. And so they're trying to avoid predation. And so they're coming along the bottom and they hit this thermal line. The fish don't like the fast change of you, know, you can kill a fish real easy. If, you're, if you want to experiment, take a live person and throw him in some lukewarm water and they'll just you know, kill him right off the bat. So they're coming up and they don't, they don't feel comfortable with a quick change of temperature. So they'll ball up right underneath that thermal line. And these white fish, because they're a cold water species, they're comfortable there too. And they come in and they start feeding on them. Well, it's a narrow strip where this thermal line gets bottom of the lake. And that's where you want to be to catch them. And it can be anywhere from uh, 45 feet, depending on you know, this year, it might be shallow because you know, there would be so much <coughs> water involved in the lake, it might be shallow. Last year, it got up to about 55, uh, even 60 feet. Guys were catching uh, the white fish. But you want to find out. And then uh, there's places. The last, last fall, the, 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 Latest I've ever been able to catch perch is about mid-October. Then when it starts getting rainy and cold, you have a bunch of mini turnovers and they just quit biting. But last fall, uh, I had my uh, kids came for Thanksgiving and we went out uh, to look for perch. In fact, I went out the day before and did some research. And uh, the best place that I know of for catching big perch in Flathead Lake is off the north, west, Oh, Jim over there, Jim over there. <laughs> 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 he's out some competition. But he, Jim fishes uh, this side, if you, if you can't see it, but the, uh, the uh, uh, metric line goes way out and then it comes in right at, at this point. And the uh, Lee Mansion is right in front of that. And so, uh, and here, uh, Normally, 35 to 40 is the magic depth for perch, but uh, when those those uh, uh, little perch are coming in from deep water and they hit that thermocline, well, then the whitefish are feeding on them right there. But then, as soon as they break through, the perch are there. You know, they, they those suckers get beat up. I'll tell you one thing. <laughs> but they seem to have a good survival rate anyway out there in the main lake. And I think it's because of the deep weed beds. They, they survive. <coughs> But uh, anyway, it was, it was uh, 29th of November, and we went out here and we caught 60 big perch. And like I say, that's the latest I've ever, ever been able to catch them. And I, I'm interested to get out there uh, early and see if they wouldn't start biting in those areas too. Uh, but uh, there was people fishing whitefish in 55 feet right out there, and they said they were catching whitefish, and there was some other people in the 50 feet, and they were catching nothing but big perch. The thermal fine uh, keeps the keeps the warm water ones above it and the cold water ones below. Okay. So this this is a typical <coughs> white fish setup. Something that's perch looking. Not that we put a fly. And these are as white as we go. Usually we're fishing darker than that. And the reason for that is, is because these little perch come along the bottom. They're the perch translucent. And so whatever their background is, that's what they look like. And because it's dark down there, what, what the white fish will see is something dark with a little bit of a flash. Uh, 
uh, coming up when they when they stir up these fish. So you uh, allure it uh, is mostly dark with a little bit of reflector tape on it. Seems to be really effective uh, for the white fish. And and because they don't have the equipment to grab a fish like a like a, a lake trout does, mouths just aren't designed for that to hit at. And so it's not unusual at all to snag a white fish. Then you got your hands full because you get a white fish in the tail. And uh, you got a strong fish that's got the upper hand for a while. But now we, we recently used a fly, and, and it seemed like, especially early, you know, last year, uh, guys started catching white fish in uh, early July in the big arm area, and they weren't feeding on perch so much. And they were also catching a lot of lake trout at the same time. Uh, but they were feeding on, on a, well, their bellies had a, a dark mushroom, so there's some kind of aquatic life down there that they were feeding on. And so guys using a dark fly and a bigger jig, actually, were doing really well uh, and putting maggots on everything. I, I, I put maggots on them even uh, during the time when, when they're uh, feeding on the perch. It just seems to, seems to help. A lot of guys don't. So, you know, that's something you can figure out what you like. But anyway, you jig it, and uh, you can jig pretty aggressively because these little perch are kind of dark now. There. But then you hold it still because when these white fish slap a fish, it stuns it. And then they're going to pick something up that's stunned. And so you jig and then you stop, and a lot of times they'll pick the fly at that particular point. Or you'll catch a lot of them, uh, even in their mouths, but you'll snag an awful lot of them too uh, with your jig. Okay. So, now for perch fishing, we've been experimenting with inline hooks and uh, all the drop shot set up, even, and found several things. I fished it all, all winter, and there was times when I was catching 90% of my fish on this second hook. And the top one, I think, it might mainly just in a tractor. But uh, if you're in a place where there, there's big predators, you know, a big predator can get on your line, especially a pike, and he'll just snip you off like a pair of scissors. Well, if he can get his mouth around it. But when, when, when a pike comes up to something like this, he just pushes your line. He, he doesn't get it around it. And so you'll hook him right in the nose. And uh, Pablo Reservoir all of a sudden has a big population of pike in it. And uh, I had. I only caught two while I was fishing for perch, but it was the same thing both times. I hooked it right in the nose and they didn't cut me off. And I've been in McGuinegar where I got cut off nine times in a row. You know, wasn't set up for piping. Uh, got into a place where there was lots of it. But yeah, I like that inline setup. Especially in East Bay where, where it's shallow. If you try to use two hooks, uh, you just have too much problem with the tangent and everything else. But if you use it, something that's in line, that works really well. And you'll have bunches of perch coming there, and you can't even see your hook. And so you just wait for a second or two and set the hook, and generally you'll have at least two on. <laughs> uh, maggots, perch eyes out there, you know, is one of the best things. Uh, some places, nightcrawler works good. Depends. Depends on what they're feeding. Sometimes the scent really helps. Uh, Pro Cure is making a, a worm scent now. <laughs> in some places it works really good. Over in Volper, apparently it works really good. But uh, uh, the thing I told me about it, Dan told me about it. He said they, they went to Lake Nera and it didn't work. So, yes, sir. Last, last year we were max fishing with your green fish. Mm -hmm. And we went over to fish for perch and we put that on and we went crazy over it. Oh? No, we'll hit any. Yeah, well, you know, they're, they're feeding on a little perch. They're just, they're, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know, no reason why they're not going to go for that. You usually get the bigger ones then, too. Yeah, yeah, good. Nice job. Yeah, some of the places now, like say Cromwell, you know, as far as catching lots of big perch, that seems to be one of the better places. But uh, guys did well back in here. This is where we were ice fishing. Um, oh, yeah. Boston, where I caught that big lake trout, uh, there was lots of perks there, but I, I wasn't getting any big ones. But a lot of times, 
Uh, that's a good place to go for big ones. And, I, and as far as white fishing goes, there's been times when I've gone all around and, and I come back and I always do the best white fishing just a little bit west of the, of the Wallstead access. Uh, it, it drops, yeah. it starts to drop. Down, oh, the first uh, uh, houses are down there. And that's, that's been, the last few years, that's been a really good hole out there. You know, if you're not catching them anywhere else, that can be a good place to go. You use this setup right now in East Bay? Can you the, the The inline setup? You know, uh, <coughs> last winter was the time when I really spent a lot of time using it. And uh, it'll work well there, uh, but the uh, uh, setup with a couple, yeah. you know, two hooks with two leaders on it also works well. But the good thing about that is it, 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 uh, it's a lot more trouble free because you don't have another line down there that uh, can tangle on you. So yeah, we, we like that setup. And it works good for coconut too. Do you use that gym at all for coconut? Sometimes. The inline? Yeah. yeah, sometimes with those fish are yeah, like real know. delicately. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty much letting you know what you know. You don't hit them on one rig time. Or... Yeah. Okay. I need, I did I send this fish around? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You did. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>